Hello, this is Key Ideas, and I'm your host, Leela Viss. This podcast contemplates the rhythm of life as a piano teacher and music maker. Through illuminating interviews and transparent reflections, you'll feel validated, encouraged, and empowered. This is episode number 53. It's puzzling why it's taken three seasons for me to finally schedule Chrissy Ricker as a guest. Her pieces are played in just about every one of my lessons. Students beg me to play her music. I'm not kidding. In our conversation, you'll learn how Chrissy naturally fell into composing and the three standards that each of her pieces must pass in order to find their way into our studios and into our students' hands. You'll adore her teaching tips too. I promise you are in for a treat. But first, here's more about Chrissy. Chrissy Ricker is a pianist, teacher, and composer from North Carolina. She received her Bachelor of Music and Master of Music degrees in piano performance and pedagogy from Meredith College in Raleigh, North Carolina. A nationally certified teacher of music, Chrissy is an active member of the Music Teachers National Association, North Carolina Music Teachers Association, and Raleigh Piano Teachers Association. Chrissy specializes in creating engaging original music and arrangements for musicians of all ages and skill levels. To date, she has published over 40 collections of piano solo and duet music for students that are available from Neil A. Chose Music Company, Piano Pronto Publishing, and SMP Press. Her piano music is featured regularly on contest lists of teaching associations across the United States and Canada, including the National Federation of Music Clubs. A prolific arranger, Chrissy has also arranged hundreds of pop, classical, video game, and anime titles for pianists of all levels. Now, here's Leela with Chrissy. So welcome, Chrissy Ricker. It seems strange that this is the first time we are officially meeting when I feel I know you so well. Your music resonates with 100% of my students. Your pieces offer something for everyone. And I just finished reading through your Let's Quest book four, and I'm stunned by the variety and the flair that you added. Like somehow you package trending sounds into captivating compositions that are pedagogically pleasing to us teachers. So today I want to get to the bottom of how you do this. So welcome again. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, So let's just start with this. How did you begin composing? You know, it's just something that I always love to do. Ever since I was a little girl taking piano lessons, it was something that came very naturally to me. Um, It was just like sitting at the piano and creating stories using music. Um, So I can't, I don't really know where it began. It was just something that was always very natural to me. And did you continue that into college, you know, and take some official composition classes? I did. I actually never had any formal composition training until I went to college. And so that was really my first experience having a composition teacher, um, taking classes like instrumentation and orchestration and and learning more of the craft of composition. Um, So that was something that I really enjoyed. Okay, you did enjoy it because I've also heard... (laughs) <laughs> that's well, okay yes okay yes go ahead <laughs> I, I enjoyed it but it was more of an academic style of composing than than I probably preferred <laughs> I'll say it that way I, but I learned a lot I, I can't I don't want to say anything too negative about my experiences but um, it was not writing in the style that I find myself writing in today mm-hmm. So you're learning a craft. And that's what I've heard, too, is that sometimes composition, a a major in composition can ruin the creative soul or something. So it sounds like it didn't do that. It it did bolster your skills and gave you the tools. Right. Well, and I actually majored in piano pedagogy. And so I I minored in composition. So I I really um, I feel like having that background in piano pedagogy taught me all of the, the things that I needed to use um, when I was composing for students. 
So, um, but it wasn't really um, probably I'd say 10 years after I graduate, graduated from college before I started really pursuing composition heavily again um, by writing for my students. And that's kind of where it all took off for me on my current path. And number one, I wish I would have done exactly what you did is do something in composition. I never did. I did one course, I think, in my undergrad. Uh, But secondly, also, I think, you know, your combination of skills is why I adore your pieces so much and why students like them as well. So who was there anyone in your path as you come to where you are today that inspired you in particular? Um, well, you know, I draw inspiration from so many different styles of music. Um, you know, I love film music. I love video game music. Um, I love rock and pop music. Um, and of course, being classically trained, there were classical composers that I always loved. Um, I love like the, the romantic character piece composers like Edvard Grieg. Um, so yeah, so I have so many different types of inspirations, I think, that I try to combine uh, when I'm writing for students. And I think that's hopefully uh, one reason that my music maybe seems kind of fresh and fun and and contemporary, because I am kind of melding these different sounds together. Oh, you're doing it so well, because that's what I noticed. uh, There's a waltz in your Let's Quest volume four, or it's not called a waltz, but it has a you know, it feels like a Chopin. Yes. Okay. And what I noticed right away is it didn't fall into some of those traps that students fall in when they're playing Chopin, because, you know, Chopin's just a little bit harder. And then, Mm -hmm. you know, you you can get hung up on those. And you offer things that yes, sound just like it or have that fresh contemporary sound, um, gives them that opportunity to play musically. But we don't get tripped up on certain things as much because you've got that pedagogical background. Right. And and I also, I try to incorporate as many patterns as I can. I think mm-hmm. patterns really are key in helping things to fit under the student's hands well, using patterns they're familiar with, and then repeating patterns so that when a student gets to a part of the piece that they've already seen that pattern before, they're like, oh, hey, I know how to play this. I did this back here. And so it, it just makes things, I think, come together really quickly for students. Well, two things that I think about right away are the fact that, yes, that's why I like your music so much, because I show them, oh, look, this is a two for one. You just learned this. And now it's right there again. They love that. And then the patterns. I'm a huge fan of pattern pieces. If you want to get a student playing, get them playing a cool pattern piece, and then they're having fun and they want to stick with it. And the other thing that I think of is that, did you ever know uh, Robert Vandal at all? Did, I, I love Robert okay. Vandal's music. I actually, I met him once uh, okay. at a workshop he did here in North Carolina. Wish wish I had, had had more of an opportunity to actually talk with him. But yes, he's definitely one of my inspirations mm. in writing pedagogical music because he writes those contemporary pattern-based pieces so well. Yeah, I, I love his music. Okay, well, I am not surprised to hear that you are inspired by him because I love his music as well. And I think that's why I gravitate towards yours as well, because you've got those patterns and the energy. He always had energy in his pieces, even if they were lyrical, they still had energy. Okay, so now it sounds like this may not happen, but what happens? I, I guess I'm curious because I'm a wannabe composer. I'll, I'll say I'm a composer, but I'm, I'm not prolific. You're a composer. Okay. I've, I've seen you play. You're a composer. <laughs> well, thank you. But uh, you know, I don't, I'm not prolific. I am, I do it when I can, I would call it my hobby. It's one of my favorite things to do, but mm-hmm. do you ever run into writer's block? Because it seems like you probably have deadlines like, Ooh, I got to get this book out. You know, do you ever have that part in your life where things aren't coming to you. Yes. Yeah. And it's a really uncomfortable feeling to be a creative (laughs) person and not be able to create. Yes. Um, I I have that happen. Um, I think one thing that helps is I do try to write every day because I think probably the, the worst part of having writer's block is just looking at a blank page. Just if you can sit down and write something, even if it's not anything that you know that you're going to eventually, you know, have in that final form, just the act of writing something, putting something in every measure on the page can kind of give you that confidence that, yes, I can do this. The ideas are still Mm -hmm. coming. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Well, two questions that I have for you, and I've asked other people the same thing, and they always, it gives them pause. I don't know if you've read Big Magic before. It's by Elizabeth Gilbert. I just want to make sure that I get the author correct. But um, she also wrote Eat, Love, Pray. Uh, she's yes. maybe known for that. So in Big Magic, she talks all about the fact that she had an idea and didn't, and and then didn't jump on it, and someone else took that idea. So her fo- her whole idea is the fact that if ideas come to her, and if they come to her and they don't, she doesn't grab onto it, somebody else is going to get it. Do you ever have that feeling? Yes, and I I tend to overthink everything. <laughs> I'm like. <laughs> And so sometimes I'll have an idea and, and while I'm kind of chewing it over and somebody else will do it. And I'm like, man, <laughs> so yeah, that happens to me a lot. Um, but you know, just, you just got to keep going. You just got to keep, keep doing it because, you know, it's, everybody's done everything at this point. <laughs> I mean, exactly. so sometimes you just got to find a way to put your own unique take, even if it's an idea that maybe someone else did something similar to it, just keep working with it and turn it into your own. Thank you for talking about that because uh, I have something called a composium that I hold with teachers to help them uh, compose, but also help their students compose. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to really talk with you about your composition process. And so much of it is validating what and how I feel. And that's all based on a book that I call or that is called Steal Like an Artist. Have you heard of that mm-hmm. before? By, yes. And that's basically what you're doing, right? You're taking ideas. And, and I think that's why you're so good at your video game music. You're listening to the video games and, you know, right. I'll have students will be paging through, oh, do you like this one? Do you like that one? And they're like, well, that sounds, that's from that, that game, you know, like, well, maybe, but I doubt it's exact, exactly right. But, Not exactly, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> And and so you know how to take an idea and make it your own. And you're right. The other thing I was thinking about as you were talking is, have you heard of an SRD? Brene Brown talks about that a lot. And I won't say the actual word that S stands for, but I'll call it shoddy, but a shoddy rough draft, you know, and sometimes you just have to get it down, get something, yes. right? Yes. And that happens with me all the time. Out and but it's just such a nice feeling when you've got something in every measure and now you can work with it and craft it and turn it into something that you're proud of. Yeah. Nice. Well, and I know some teachers are going to be listening to you just because, of course, they're big fans of yours. And some of them are going to want to know, you know, get into your head. How do you compose? But also some of them want to know, you know, as a pedagogue yourself, you know, how do you create pedagogically sound and appealing music at the same time? Like, do you have some parameters Mm -hmm. that you follow? Yes. Um, Well, whenever I'm writing for students, there are three questions that I always ask Mm -hmm. myself. Um, The first question, is this piece fun to play? You know, does it fit under the hands well? Does it feel good? Does it use patterns that a student at this level of development will be familiar with? Uh, Is it comfortable? You know, no awkward stretches. Um, So is it fun to play? Second, is it fun to listen to? Because there's a lot of of beginner classical music out there that's just really dry and not fun to listen to. So I Mm want to write things, even if it's a beginner level piece, I want a student to play it at the recital and parents to say, hey, that was a great piece. I loved hearing that. So is it fun to listen to? Is it catchy? Is it something that students are going to want to play for their friends? And then third, does this piece teach the student something important? You know, whether it's a technical skill, an artistic skill, um, does it teach them something that's going to prepare them for future music that they're going to play one day? And so whenever I'm writing a piece, I look at the piece, I ask myself those three questions. And if I can't answer yes to those three questions, it either goes in my file to be reworked or it goes in the trash can. Okay. (laughs) And, And I throw a lot of things away if I can't answer yes to those three questions, but it's really important to me to be able to, to write pieces for students that, that I can get a yes for all three of those criteria. Nice. And uh, so when you come up with these three answers to these three questions, do you test them out at all on your students? 
Occasionally I do. I try to be really careful not to use my students as guinea pigs too much because <laughs> I, I don't want them to feel like we always have to play things that our teacher writes. Um, so, I mean, I really, I, I kind of teach a variety of, of music. I'll sneak one of my pieces in there if I feel like it's going to be a really good fit for that particular student. Um, now, sometimes I do write things for a student if I see that they're struggling with a certain concept. I'll write a piece specifically for them that ends up working its way into one of my um, collections. But do you have, not to... I'm sorry, do you have an index at all of, you know, okay, this piece is good for, and this piece is good for? Um, not really. Uh, up here, maybe. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I kind of, um, I, now I do usually think of um, like the technical patterns and, um, you know, artistic things as I'm writing pieces. I wish I had been organized enough to do some kind of catalog like that, but unfortunately, no. Well, put that on your list of things to do if you're not busy I'll enough already. That, add that to my to-do list. That would be actually very handy. So yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to put that request in and, you know, we can all see things that, you know, a piece can, uh, how a piece could enhance a student's technique or whatever, but knowing, okay, go to this piece. If you're having this problem, go to this piece. Um, I could see that very beneficial. So put that on your list. I don't know, yeah. maybe start well, one book at a time, right? Yes. Well, and actually um, there is one book in particular. I actually did write the whole book with that in mind. And it's um, one of my perfect patterns books. It's the perfect patterns plus, mm -hmm. um, which is, is the fourth book in that series. Each of those pieces was specifically written for a different technical um, idea that students would encounter. So there's a piece based on arpeggios. There's a piece based on broken chords. There's a piece based on playing rolled chords. So I actually have done that collection that is very much, you know, each piece is a different technique, but. Um, well, yeah. I, use, I use that book as well. So yeah, okay, that's good to know. And you know, I think that will make me think a little bit, oh, you know, what is this piece really getting after? I, I go for the appeal and the fun versus right. the, you know, what it's going to teach. I know it's going to teach something. You, you always know that there's going to be something that will teach, but um, the first two are really important to me. So, right. And I don't want students to, to look at a piece and say, oh, this piece, broken chords. I don't want them to think they're about to play a little, an exercise piece. So sometimes you kind of have to hide those little nuggets in um, so that students don't know that they're actually practicing their broken chords. You're just tricking them. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. So, okay, your your music defaults uh, to you know student students liking it immediately. Like there's there's no question. <laughs> I remember I was playing something. I was playing one of your pieces for a student, and he said, "I will play that." You know, <laughs> I will play that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> like very determined. It wasn't, you know, like, um, I, I remember, you know, just asking and give me a thumbs up or thumbs down, but it was adamant, like, I will play that. So we're and that's we're, high praise. If you can, because uh, I have some picky students too. So when you can get a student like that, that is high praise for a composer. <laughs> so you seem to be in touch with what kids like. So obviously, you are in touch with your students, but how do you find this music? You know, what are you doing to get these musical ideas into your pieces and know that they're going to be a hit with kids? You know, I really just try to, to write things that I personally would enjoy playing. Um, you know, even it could be a beginner level piece, but if I can sit down and play it and think, yeah, this sounds pretty cool. This is fun. And I can play it a few times and, and it's catchy and it's fun to listen to. Um, yeah, I just write things that I would enjoy playing, you know, even as an adult. Do you and get requests from students? I'm sorry. Do you get requests from students like, oh, I want to play a piece uh, about this or from this video game or from this movie? I do. I do. Um, and, and I do. Sometimes I arrange like the actual mm -hmm. piece when possible, but sometimes um, it's a good opportunity to write something that's at a more accessible level mm -hmm. that has a similar style and a similar feel. Um, and that's something I love to do because um, I think if you can kind of take the essence of, of a genre or of a composer that students really like and create something that's accessible, 
um, then that's a, a really good way to get students interested in playing a piece um, and, and kind of doing something that has that similar sound, but is more at their level. Yes. And that word accessible, that's my favorite one. I hate the word easy. And um, I, I, I just accessible just means that you can grab onto it, you can play it and have fun with it. Maybe there's some challenges, but I totally agree with the fact that that's what's going to keep, keep kids on the bench is creating music that sounds like what they're hearing and what they like, but then letting them right. play it. So your pop covers that you are making. I love them because they're not crowded and cluttered with extra things that don't need to be there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of the one that I can't remember now which one I got, but you know how you get a pop arrangement and then there's what guitar tabs and there's the vocal line and you know, like you've right. really, I don't want to, okay. I'm not going to say dumb it down, but you simplify things to the bare essence of what what's going to sound good, what's going to make this pianist feel like, yes, I am playing this piece. Right, right. And sometimes there are things that are in the piece that maybe don't work particularly well for the piano. So you've got to think it, how a pianist would play this, this you know, piece differently. You know, if, if the guitar and the drums aren't there, what can I do on the piano that's going to make this sound good on the piano? So just kind of um, the approach to it and thinking of how you can make it fit what the student already knows. Right. Can be uh, helpful. So are there any styles that you kind of stay away from? No, nope. I will teach anything my students are willing to learn. Um, and I've, I've taught some things that maybe weren't my first choice for students, but I'm a really big proponent of the fact that you can find a pedago pedagogical nugget in anything. And so if a student says, I want to learn this piece, you know, even if it's something I think, okay, that's not something I would have picked, but I look for what I can teach the student with that piece and use that as a vehicle to teach, you know, technique or theory or whatever it is. So yeah, I will teach anything. <laughs> I will too, which is not an easy thing to do, but you're absolutely yes. right. There's always a nugget. Uh, someone brought, he had, you know, a whole book of video game music and this composer was quite something with his choice of chords and all that kind of stuff. And this was a newer student who didn't know anything about chords, but he knew he liked the sound. And so I was pulling him back. Okay, here's the four chords that are usually used. In, in most music. And now you're going to see, take a look at what this guy's doing. And so we really went, got under the hood and then it was fun for me and fun for him. We'll be right back. Do you struggle with helping students to understand how to shape and play a beautiful phrase? I did until I turned to storytelling as my teaching method. Hello, my name is Kay Lowry. For years, I have told my students a fairy tale to inspire their imagination and help them understand how to shape a phrase. Recently, I realized I needed not only to tell them the story, I needed to show them the story in visual form. So I created the Musical Magical Queen. In this fairy tale, a magical queen holds power over all the notes. She can wave her wand and choose a note in each phrase to be the queen note. All of the other notes have to serve the queen note. In this resource, students can click on audio files and have the story narrated for them. They can also click on examples of how to play the phrase beautifully and how not to play. That is boring and flat. You can even print a version to have and give to your students. My younger students loved the story, but my older students and some boys asked me for a superhero version. That led me to create Tonal and Sonica, heroes of the phrase. The story is very similar, but reads more like a comic book. Both stories feature five different scenarios in music and give tips on how we as musicians can select our own queen notes. 
My students really got into the stories and ignited their musical imagination. Teachers can read the story, talk about the examples, and even draw small crowns or jewels into a student's score as reminders of where the phrase is going. The result? Beautiful playing. You can print this resource or send it home digitally with my easy tips. Both stories are available at lelavis.com forward slash K. You can use the coupon code K20, that's K-A-Y-2-0, for 20% off of all my products. Now back to our conversation. Yeah, sometimes I think you just have to, as a teacher, be open to some of these new styles and artists that, Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of pop music out there I don't listen to, but my student will bring it in and we'll go through it together and I'll develop an appreciation for it, seeing it through the lens of, of them learning it. So, yeah. So let's get under the hood of your teaching. So if you are going to teach one of your pieces to one of your students, can you tell us a little bit about that process? Um, Well, you know, I really don't do anything differently with teaching my own pieces than I would do for anyone else's pieces. Um, One of the big things I always talk about with my students is we try to get into the composer's head when we're learning a piece and figure out, you know, why did the composer pick this title? Why did the composer pick this chord? Why are these notes staccato and these over here are legato? So, you know, I really, I guess the only difference is, is when I'm teaching a piece that I wrote, I know the answer to those questions, <laughs> whereas if we're doing a piece that Beethoven wrote, maybe I don't know why both Beethoven picked that chord. I can guess. <laughs> right. But um, but yeah, I really don't do anything differently because I want all of my students to go through the process of kind of understanding what the composer was thinking mm-hmm. as they're learning the piece. Nice. Do you ever put white out on your name just so they don't know who it's by? <laughs> Yeah. I, well, not really. I don't know if I've ever had to go to that extent. A lot of times I'll offer students pieces and not tell them I wrote it. And and sometimes they'll be like, oh, no, I don't want to play that. <laughs> it hurts my feelings a little. I'll just be like, OK. Uh, no. yeah, okay. But, but yeah, but I don't make a big deal out of it. You know, it, if it's a piece I wrote or someone else wrote it, you know, I, I approach it the same way. Nice. So you ask a lot of questions. And then do you usually go section by section? Because that's what I love about your pieces is, you know, we can chop it up into sections. Okay, let's look at this first pattern here. And this is the pattern you're going to work on this week. Do you do the same thing? I do. And sometimes I don't even do the sections in order. Sometimes I like Mm -hmm. one of my favorite ways of practicing is starting at the end Mm -hmm. and working backwards, um, or maybe starting at the very trickiest section and Mm -hmm. working our way out. Um, But yeah, it's definitely um, learning the patterns in the pieces first is a great way to do it because Mm -hmm. then students feel really confident and comfortable because they're going to encounter those things in other parts of the piece and they'll already be familiar with them. Now on your website, you have, of course, all kinds of music, but you also have tips for teaching. So I'd be interested, do you have any practice tips? Do you have any practice strategies that you have found really work with your students? You talked about, you know, I call that inside out, what starting in the middle and then working your way out. Do you have any other kind of tips that you like to use with your students? Right. Well, you know, I'm really big on helping my students learn how to practice. Mm -hmm. And so the kind of the two things we focus on is first knowing how to identify a problem. So if they're working on a piece, they need to know, you know, if they're playing a wrong note or if they're playing without a steady beat, or if they're ignoring the dynamics, they need to be able to self-diagnose. And so just kind of leading through them through questions. On mm-hmm. my website, I actually have a little chart. I call it the practice cake. Oh, and it's just a series of questions for each musical element. So for rhythm, for dynamics, for notes and fingerings. And I just, we go through this series of questions for each element in the music so we can kind of diagnose if there are any problems that they're having. And then the other half of the equation is how do you fix those problems? So just strategies like the backwards practicing or the inside out practicing. Um, I love doing slow, medium, fast practicing. Um, I'll have kids choose an animal 
Um, so first we're going to practice it like a turtle and then we're going to practice it like a kitty cat. And then we're going to practice it like a cheetah. And um, we'll even draw a picture of a turtle in the music to remind them to practice something slowly. Um, so yeah, just different strategies like that, that they can, when they're at home, kind of go through that list of strategies and think, okay, what would be the best way to practice this section? Um, yeah. No, yeah. I really think that piano lessons are really more like practice lessons. <laughs> You know, they really need to learn that skill. And even adults do not know how to practice, which right. surprised me. I just thought that, okay, wouldn't you know this? But if you're not learning a new skill, if you have been working for 30 years at the same job, you're probably not practicing a new skill, right? So a lot of it is self-awareness. And I love the fact that you've got what you've got questions to ask and then strategies on how to fix things. Right. Yeah. And one thing that surprised me uh, as a teacher, you know, a lot, a lot of times just students aren't listening to themselves. They aren't aware, like a student will come in and play, have practiced a piece all week without looking at the key signature, <laughs> things like that, that you just take for granted yes. um, that students are going to notice. You can't take those things for granted. So, yeah. So I think that's important just to kind of guide students through that process. So they know what to look for, how to break things down uh, and how to work independently so that they can do those things at home when you're not sitting next to them. And also without a parent nagging them, right? I mean, you know, I, I, I love parents, but I also want to give parents a break. I want to equip students so that they are set to go and can practice on their own as much as possible, because I know there's enough battles going on at home with everything yes. else. You know, I really, that's my goal as soon as possible to get those kids equipped with those skills so that they can enjoy themselves without having to be nagged. You know, we don't yes. like to be nagged, right? Right. Nobody likes that. <laughs> No. So, and I, a lot of it has to do with self-awareness, right? If they are aware, and I'll, I'll actually throw this at them, like your brain wants to play that F natural instead of F sharp, doesn't it? And, you know, and then we'll talk about why. Oh, that's because there was that F natural over there. And I think once we discuss why there's a reason why you're making that mistake, that helps them as well. You know, right. the, like, oh yeah, okay. It's because, you know, our brains qu learn quickly, but then they expect it to be the same all the time. And right. then when things change, it's a surprise to them. Right. So, and that's what I love about pattern pieces is, you know, oh, suddenly the pattern changes. Okay, we got to watch out for that. So, okay, well, we'll make sure that we add some of those things into the show notes. Like, what is it called? Your practice cake? Is that what you call practice it? Practice cake. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I love the slow, medium, fast. I, mean, I, I love any tactile thing, right? Anything that you can set out and remind students of, oh, let's practice like a turtle or, you know, whatever choice. Yeah. Whatever. It, it, yeah, go ahead. Gamify it, gamify it, yes. make it something that's fun. Um, another, I'll, I'll share another one really quick that I like to do um, is starting over practice, but I compare it to a video game. And so we get, um, I use these little, I think I have them right here, which we're on a podcast. You can't see what yeah. I'm holding up to the camera. But, I'll take a picture. Um, these little, yeah. These little puzzle erasers. Uh -huh. I set three of them on the end of the piano and I'll say, okay, we're going to play this line. You've got three lives. Get through that line without <laughs> okay. making a mistake. Yeah. If you make a mistake, I'm taking one away and you have to start over. And kids, this is like a video game. So kids are really familiar with this concept. Yeah. Um, and so it you know, it's amazing to me, students that like to guess at the notes will really slow down and pay attention and watch the music yeah. so carefully because they don't want to lose their little life. They don't want to have to start that line over. So, you know, just little things like that to kind of, make it more like a game, I think can be really helpful when you're practicing. Oh, that's a fun idea. Cause I've done, you know, okay, move it over to the other side. Once they get it right, move it over to the other side. Uh -huh. But I love the three lives thing or the five lives or whatever. Oh, right. this week you get five lives, you know, <laughs> whatever, right. but okay. Oh, that's fun. So now I got to get some little kitty cats. students love that strategy. Yes. Oh, that's fun. Okay. Uh, so then I, my next question was headed towards motivation, which we just talked about that, that gamification. Do, I bet your students just love to see Miss Ricker every week, or do some of them show up and they haven't practiced? Well, yes, they, they <laughs> show up and they haven't practiced sometimes. Um, yeah, I, I wish I had students who practiced every single week, all the time. But you know, like like all students, there are ups and downs. Um, especially some of my students who are you know high school, middle school, mm -hmm. busy with other activities. Mm -hmm. 
But um, so there's definitely an ebb and a flow. Um, but as far as motivation goes, I think probably the number one thing that I try to do as much as possible is give students choices. Mm-hmm. So choices about what repertoire we're working on. Um, all of my students have a wish list that they keep in their notebooks. So they, they write down pieces that they're interested in playing. And that's great motivation because if we're working on a piece that they've kind of been dragging their feet on finishing up, I'll say, you know, <laughs> if you finish that piece next week, we can pick something off of your wish list to do next. So that's nice. been great. Um, and then choices um, as far as setting goals. We always set goals at the beginning of each semester um, of what type of music we're going to work on. You know, maybe their goal is to write a piece, you know, do a composition project. Maybe their goal is to play a duet with a friend or play at their church sometime that semester. So, you know, setting goals of things that they want to accomplish. And then even in the lesson, I try to give students choices. You know, do you want to start with your C major scale or your A minor scale? Um, Do you want to play out of your technique book or out of your lesson book first? You know, do you want to use um, the red pen or the blue pen (laughs) to to write your notes today? So just I feel like choices just give students ownership Mm -hmm. over the lesson. It makes them feel more invested, um, you know, if, if they have a choice over what they're doing. Um, and, and even choices over how they're going to practice the piece. You know, I'll say, what strategies are you going to use to practice the piece this week? I want you to write down three things in your notebook that you're going to do this week. Um, and then if they don't do it, I'll say, hey, you're the one who came up with that, that strategy. What's going on? Those were your, your ideas. So, yeah, so I think that's probably the number one motivational tool that I like to use is just giving choices anytime I can. You know, I have a sister who lives in Raleigh, North Carolina, but I think you're my other sister that lives in North Carolina because <laughs> you talk exactly the way I like to talk about practicing and motivation. It is all about choices because if yeah. they take ownership, they will continue, right? And if mm-hmm. you give them the skills to, or the strategies, uh, choices of strategies, then they can start fixing it themselves. And that's what keeps them there because it's their gig and not ours. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yes. So um, now what do you do when you want your students to improvise and compose? Like, do you do that on a regular basis? You know, you said you let them make choices. Like I generally have an agenda, like, okay, you know, we're going to work on this and this and this, but of course they have choices on what repertoire. So how do you introduce right. those kinds of units in your studio? Yeah. Um, Well, you know, I love, as I said, when I was growing up, I always loved improvising, composing and being creative. So I always just assumed that my students were going to love it, too. (laughs) Uh And I quickly found out that that's not always true for every student. For some students, it's very stressful and um, they get really you know, scared to try to to improvise. They're afraid of playing something that sounds bad. Um, Mm -hmm. They're afraid of not having the music in front of them. Mm -hmm. And so um, very early on, I try to look for opportunities to be creative with the pieces that we're working on. So if we're working on a piece called The Lazy Elephant, I might say, what do you think The Lazy Elephant's going to do at the end of this piece? Can you show me a little ending that you think Mm -hmm. fits what The Lazy Elephant will do? Or um, I'll say, how would this piece sound different if it were called the energetic bunny rabbit? <laughs> you know, and we'll, we'll create something using the same notes, but playing them in a different way. So just kind of looking for those creative opportunities. And then when we do improvise, it's something I like to do kind of if I have a, a few minutes at the end of a lesson or just kind of fit in a different different places in a lesson. The, one of the first activities I like to do is a 12 bar blues using the black keys. And so I set lots of parameters. And so I'll tell a student, okay, I'm going to play this pattern. I want you to use these two black keys and play quarter notes. That's it. So two notes and quarter mm-hmm. notes. And so we'll do that activity at every lesson for a month or maybe even two months, you know, as long as it takes for the student to get comfortable with that set of parameters. And so I think it really just comes down to, you know, looking for those opportunities to be creative and giving students lots of parameters so they feel safe and comfortable being creative and just doing it as much as possible. Nice. I And I think it's fun when you give them all these strict 
rules about this is what you need to do and then how fast they end up breaking them right mm -hmm. because they want to or you know they accidentally do something a little bit different but like oh that's cool that's your creativity showing right, up right right and some students do that and they're like oh wait i wasn't supposed no. to and i'm like no it's fine <laughs> yeah. yeah oh that's neat so and then have do you have a lot of composers in your studio as well do they come to you for composition or is that just part of the lesson at some point well you know it's something i do with all of my students some students are really you know that's something they really want to focus mm -hmm. on other students it's kind of do we do we have to <laughs> and um i i look at composition as functional music theory and mm -hmm. so it's really important to me that students learn how to notate um, you know, they learn how to use chords and how to construct a melody. And um, so, yeah, so it's something that I do with all my students, but some of them do it more than others just because they you know, really have a passion for it. Right. And I think no. my job is to expose them, our job right. as teachers. And then, you know, I would hate it if someone someday come, graduates from my studio and, well, Miss Leela never did that with me. You know, like, I guess I feel like there's a little bit of pressure to give them as much as they can so that they can look back and say, oh, yeah, I did that. I remember doing that, you know, I th um, which is right. a little different from the traditional style of piano teaching. I think I think we've kind of branched out from. Right. Yeah. And I, I what I find and really thinking back to my own you know, piano lessons growing up is I do try to incorporate lots of different musicianship opportunities. So improvising and composing and playing by ear and transposing and, you know, all these things, because, you know, some students might struggle in one area, but there might be another area that they really excel at. And so I know that at every lesson, I can give them something that they're going to be successful at. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just, I, and it makes the lessons more fun for me too, if I can incorporate this, this wide variety of skills, um, it, every lesson's different, which I think is really fun and exciting. It is. We've got a great career, don't we? Yeah. Yes. Great job. So, so how do you balance? I, I'm, I'm, this is just personally, I'm very curious about how do you balance your teaching time versus your writing time? Um, yes, it, well, I, you know, when I first started composing, I was teaching a lot. <laughs> and so I just had to kind of fit it in you know, weekends or early in the morning. Now I try to kind of have a routine where I don't have as many students. And so I can, you know, write in the mornings. Um, and of course now over the summer, I'm not teaching right now. So I have you know, lots of time to finish my projects, but it's, it's kind of just getting on a schedule of writing every day has been helpful and um, just kind of, keeping that writing time really separate and dedicated so that right. I know that's my time to work. Very disciplined. So we can find your music at a number of different places. Let us know where we can find all your publications. Yes. So I um, have some pieces available through Chose Music Company. Um, I first started writing with Chose back in 2013. So that was um, the first publishing company I started working with. And Destinations, right? Destination Adventure? Destination Adventure. Okay. How many books do you have of that one? There's three. There's three. three. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was just talking to Charlene jarvish Sheltsey. Uh We're mm -hmm. recording a podcast right now as well, or we're finishing up, and she just wanted to me to tell you that she has all your music and then she mentioned how much she loves those destination adventures books so what else do you have at Ch oh and she loved the prelude books as well right yes That's i have two books preludes to mastery mm -hmm. and um those were books that i wrote to cover uh, as many key signatures as possible and to uh, include all the different historical styles so baroque classical romantic contemporary Wow. Um, so those are really fun books. And then I also have one duet book with Chose, um, Toe Tap and Tunes for Two. Oh, fun. <laughs> a fun title. Um, so yes, yeah, so I, I uh, have several things with Chose. Um, I started working with Piano Pronto in 2016. And I think I have somewhere around 20 collections with Piano Pronto at this point. So I've got um, my Let's Quest series that you mentioned, mm -hmm. Perfect Pattern series, 
um, Cool Cat series, which is jazz inspired pieces, Mm -hmm. um, uh, Christmas medley magic books, um, Rockin' Christmas series, which the um, second book in that series just came out this summer. Sorry, I'm I'm trying to remember. No, no. And all the ones that you're listing, like, yep, I have that one. Yep, I have that one. Yep. And oh, the Christmas ones in particular, uh, Charlene and I are going to do an episode on just Christmas music. And I could just go on and on about all your selections because they just, oh my goodness. Like you're rocking Merry Gentleman, I think it was. Oh, Uh Cameron just yeah. went nuts over that one. He loved it. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I wrote those um, books for my students because I had so many students that they'd be really super excited about Christmas music the first couple of years. And then by the third year, they'd be like, I played that already. Yeah. <laughs> I played that already. And so I started writing these medleys and mashups and rock inspired arrangements because I they were interesting and exciting for my students who wanted something a little bit different from the traditional Christmas arrangements. So I'm glad that your students have enjoyed them. Oh, yes. And, you know, I'll say, well, would you like to play a Christmas Christmas piece? And most people will say yes. And then some people are like, well, I don't know. But then I uh-huh. show they don't understand, like, look, there are some amazing Christmas tunes out here. You're going to really like these. And then once once they see the arrangements and how colorful they are, then they're all in. Right. Great. Yes. All right. Um, And then, yes, where else can we find um, you? Oh, So the other place is Music Notes. So I started Ah. arranging with Music Notes. um, It's been a little over two years ago now. And so all of my video game, um, film, pop uh, arrangements are are found there. And and that's been so much fun for me to be able to arrange all of those video game things that my students have requested for years and years. And to be able to make these arrangements available for other teachers um, who have students that need accessible arrangements that they can play, you know, at the elementary, late elementary, early mm. intermediate levels. Huge gift. And the music, the reason why you go through music notes is they own the copyright then, right? You don't have to worry right. about all of that. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, that's, that's fantastic that you've gotten that gig because yeah, we need more of those arrangements when we go to, you know, those what those digital catalogs, because a lot of them are just crazy hard, or they've got way too much stuff in them that don't need to be there. So I'm so glad that you're there as well. And right. I was just referring someone to, uh, uh, to, I was referring your video game music to someone because they were in search of that. So I love having a solid answer. Hey, where do I go for video game music? You know, that's actually from a video game. And I know exactly where to go. I go to Chrissy Ricker. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's been a big focus of mine because I have so many students who love video game music and to be able to actually publish now these arrangements that are written for students and aren't, like you said, crazy difficult yeah. uh, has been really fun for me. And now anywhere else did I forget anything? Um, I, I have a little bit on Sheet Music Plus. Oh, okay. Um, just a little, but but those are my, my main... Uh, publishing companies I'm working with right now. And what I like about your site, if you just go to chrissyricker.com, you have links to all of those places. Yes. 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 So you can go to that one place. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a link to um, each collection so you can see the cover and listen to uh, samples. And then I also have a catalog site um, that you can get to through my website where you can search by level. So like if you're looking specifically for elementary level pieces that use patterns, you can see all the pieces I've written that are at that level that are pattern based. So oh, now you just have to add in that little pedagogical concept type I thing. Know. Yeah. <laughs> just do that quick a minute. I know. I but, know. You know. Only a thousand pieces right. to, to go through. Oh, really? So, how many have you written? Have you ever counted how many arrangements and compositions altogether? Yeah, it's over a thousand. I, wow. I have a little database. So. And you're what? Still 29. You look still 29. Oh, but, thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> older than that. Okay. But I'll take it. Okay. Oh, Chrissy, this has been fantastic sharing some time with you because like I said, your name pops up in about every lesson. I am not exaggerating either. So you are a very important part of my teaching. And I'm so thankful that we finally had this time to connect. Um, How about if we end with a favorite quote from you? 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, One of my favorite quotes I'd like to share is by someone who's not a musician, but this is someone who was very active in the field of arts education and someone I'm sure that you all know and love, Mr. Bob Ross of The Joy of Painting. I adore him. I I love him. If you've ever watched his shows, he has so many little nuggets of wisdom that he sprinkles in. And a quote by him that I absolutely love, talent is a pursued interest. Anything that you're willing to practice, you can do. And, And I just love that because I think there, there's such a misconception sometimes in the arts that if you're born naturally talented at music, for example, and if you're not born naturally talented, then you shouldn't even bother taking piano lessons. Um, and, and I think that's just a sad way to look at it because I think every student has the potential to be a great musician. Um, we just have to nurture and, and find the areas that, that they can excel at. Um, so yeah, any. Anything you're willing to practice, you can do. I love that. And okay, when I think back to watching him, why were we all captivated and mesmerized by him? He'd be like, let's put a little bird here, you know? I'm like, well, that wasn't a big deal. Okay, I can put a bird there. And so he, I, he broke it down, right? And made yes, it simple. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So when you're watching him, you could think, I could do that. Yeah. You know, he makes it look so easy. And he's such a gentle, you know, kind seeming person when you watch his videos and just kind of explaining the process and encouraging. Mm. Yeah, I think he, very inspirational. Thank you for bringing that up because that just makes me think, you know, that is kind of opposite of our music world where this is difficult and it must be this way and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, think of thinking of ourselves as a Bob Ross in our piano lessons, like, oh, let's just do this. All you need to do is that. And I think you once you bring it down to a level that seems manageable, people want to come back and, and for another lesson and for more. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's the the encouragement and, you know, loving the process, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, Chrissy, it has been such a wonderful conversation with you and a privilege to take time with you. So I can't thank you enough. And we will make sure that we have all these links, basically a link to your site for sure. And then a couple of the other things that we mentioned in the show notes. And I can't wait to share our conversation with the world. So thanks so much for being here today with me. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed speaking with you. It's hard to imagine the impact that the prolific Chrissy Ricker has had on my teaching and has and will have on my students. But wait, it's not just my students, but thousands of teachers and their students. What a gift she has given us through her appealing sheet music, accessible arrangements of student-requested pop songs and video game tunes, and her insightful teaching tips. Head to the show notes to find out more about Chrissy and where you can access her vast and ever-growing library of sheet music and digital downloads. I'm Leela Viss. See you in the trenches and most likely teaching one of Chrissy's pieces.